Thank you for being a part of this public input process. We just had an in-person meeting a few weeks ago at Lee University. We wanted to cast a really wide net, get as many of our anglers involved, and offer this online or digital version as well. It'll be very similar. And these management plans come up for, for review every several years, and it's a way for us to get our thoughts on paper, what we're doing over the next few years, and to involve the public on their values and perceptions and get you all involved as well. The Hawassee Trout Fishery or Appalachia Tailwater, it's located in southeastern Tennessee. It is one of 29 of TVA's projects. There's four dams upstream of Appalachia and there's a lot that goes on with those upstream lakes of thermoclines, weather patterns, forage availability, all this is predetermined by, for our water that's coming down into Tennessee and which makes the management of it more complicated. And then when you look at things like people are drinking the water once it's in Tennessee, it's water quality is important, it's being used for hydroelectric facilities upstream and for cooling water at Sequoia Nuclear Reactor downstream. We have fish like lake sturgeon and uh, other protective species like the hellbender that are in there that need good clean water as well. And then when you look at flood control and protecting people and property as a component of this dam as well. This is all before we're getting into the people that are floating the river or fishing the river. Currently we have a delayed harvest regulation for the trout on Hawassi and this is from October 1st through the end of February and it is catch and release only, no bait, artificial lures and once March comes around it goes to a seven fish creel and only two can be brown trout. So from downstream of the railroad uh, any time of the year, it is a seven fish, uh, seven trout in combination, any species. It's the statewide limit for trout. The hope with, or the goal of the delayed harvest is that it allows us to put a lot of fish in during the winter, get them feeding on shad, some of those natural foods, and getting good growth going and spreading out, being more natural fishery before the busy stocking season and fishing season comes in March. Once our delayed harvest comes into effect in early October, we're looking at water temperatures to get those fish in. If it's too warm in the river, it's gonna be challenging to load those fish, to haul those fish, as well as to stock them. And we don't wanna risk losing a, a whole truckload of fish. Once we're into the spring, we'll be sending two trucks a month uh, with fish and it's a combination of brown trout and rainbow trout. We do have some rainbows, some cutthroats, and brook trout, depending on the availability from those hatcheries. And there's 75,000 total fish going in. That includes several hundred rainbow trout that are retired broodfish. They're all in that 16 to 18 inch range. And several thousand rainbow or brown trout that we've held an additional year at Teleco. Those are gonna be 12 to 15 inches on average, but this year some of them have been 16 to 20 inches. Some really nice fish going in straight off the truck. We go out twice a year with our electro fishing surveys, once in the fall and once in the winter. The fall sample lets us figure out what has held over through that Hawassi summer, and the winter sample lets us know what's made it through that delayed harvest and what our population looks like going into the busy season. This figure shows the five-year electrofishing average. So as we're going out, we make the same pass each year. And if, as long as we're consistent, if we're seeing variation in our fish numbers, that's gonna be because of the fish and not because of us. So this is so showing that catch per hour of rainbow trout in the winter at blue and then orange is the fall. And then there's another side-by-side -side one of the rainbow trout over 12 inches. So during the fall, we are seeing a few rainbows hold over. It's about one fish per hour. Compare that to the amount of fish we're seeing in the winter sample. And then for the brown trout, similar story. There's just a few that are making it through. 
the net fall sample and that holdover. In 2023, we went out and put these temperature loggers that record water temperature once an hour in a case on the bottom of the river and had them at Reliance, downstream of Big Bend there at the stairs, downstream of uh, Tywood Creek along those shoals. And these things allowed us to look at the temperature over time. So for the upstream temperature logger that we had out this past summer, this is the temperature over time. The red dashed line at 68 degrees Fahrenheit is the upper avoidance limit for those trout. If it's above that, the fish are gonna be more stressed. They're gonna be feeding less. They will have higher risk of disease and predation. And then once you're into the low 70s, you start having uh, direct uh, mortality from those temperatures as that they can't keep up with their metabolism. And for this, uh, the Towie one, which is about a mile and a half from the powerhouse, we saw some spikes in temperature in July, but really by the time we're in that final week of August is when we start getting consecutive days above 68 degrees. And then into September, our daily averages and our daily minimums are above 68. And then you can see as it starts to cool off with the, those first frosts in October. Moving down to the stair steps, this is three miles from the powerhouse. Everything was about a degree Fahrenheit warmer and that timeline moved forward about a week. So the third week of August is when things started to go sideways for those trout. However, down at Reliance, you can see the May cooling period or when they're uh, filling up the reservoirs. And then by the 4th of July, we're consistently getting those temperatures above 68 degrees. And then those daily averages and maximum are in the low 70s pretty consistently throughout July and August. Well, how does that compare? In 2023, during the months of August and September, we averaged 68 degrees Fahrenheit at Reliance and maxed out at 74.5. Compare that to 2019 when we averaged at 70.6 and reached almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And then those other years fall somewhere in between. But uh, when you think about those figures of up at the stair steps, uh, 2023 was one of the colder years we've had in the last five years, with 2019 being pretty warm. So in addition to looking at the fish and looking at water quality. We'll also go out every several years and we'll do creel surveys or angler interviews. We go out with, uh, this year was Cleveland State students and some of our own staff at over or nearly a hundred randomly selected times at randomly selected days. And this allows us to interview everyone we see, count everyone we can see, and to start using some formulas and estimations of what's going on over the rest of the picture. So this is showing our monthly hours uh, in the black bar and then the orange line is going to be that average catch rate of our anglers that month and that's everyone from an expert to a beginner. So during the delayed harvest pretty low effort and pretty low catch rate but it picked up in April and May. A lot of people fishing, a lot of people catching. There was a dip in June when our creel clerks made some notes that the access points were so busy with other people recreating that there weren't many people fishing. July picked back up and then August and September slowed down as those water temperatures were in the high 60s, low 70s, the bite turned off and people stopped fishing for them as well. So how does that compare to years past? Our survey went from October of 22 through September of 23 and we've had these surveys in 2013, 2004, and 1999. We average 1.0 trout per hour in our survey, which is right at the, the national target for fishery managers use for a good fishery. In 2013, when it was really busy uh, and was fishing really well, was 1.9 fish an hour. And 1999 was down to around 0.9. And then looking at the percent of fish that are harvested in a given year based on what we stocked, in 2023, we only saw 12% of our fish, or of our trout being harvested. And on the other end of that spectrum in 2013, it was only at 23%. And then this column is the percent of fish caught and released 
uh, so harvested as well, and only 48% uh, of the fish that we put out in 2023 uh, were showed up in our estimates. However, in 2013, it was up to 92%. In those other years, 2004 and 99, kind of hovered around 50%. Diving into the weeds a little bit, 35% of our anglers were using fly tackle, 40% were spin, and 25% were bait. So bait is gonna be corn, worms, uh, dough bait, something like a power bait, or eggs. And they all had a similar catch rate around 1.0, and the harvest rates were different. Our fly fishermen only harvested 0 0.05 trout per every hour that are out there, and the bait fishermen were at 0.5, so that would be every two hours of effort for a bait fisherman, there's one trout that took a ride in the truck back to town. 33% of our anglers were using a boat, 44% were on the bank, and 43% were wade fishing. We asked an economic question of our anglers as well, the, of what they spent on that day's trip. Things like gas, groceries, tackle, fishing line, if it was already in the garage or in the refrigerator, it didn't count. It was just on that specific day. And that allows us to get out of direct expenditure, which we saw $476,000 over the course of that year. And then zooming in of just within 20 miles was $338,000. So as we're working through this public process, it's important to keep in mind that April to July are our busiest month. There's a lot of people fishing and a lot of people catching fish during those time frames. And those water temperatures are crucial. We're dealing with a big piece of concrete in the river channel that has cold water releases that allow us to stock these non-native fish. So we're dependent on that magnitude and volume of cold water to have a successful trout fishery. We do get some of that holdover from year to year. It's very little and consistently low. And there's just a limited number of parking spaces available for our trout to find that cold water over that summertime. There's a little bit of variation with weather patterns we saw from 2019 to 2023 that have seemed to affect that holdover, but it's still overall low. And then also a low utilization rate of those trout. Only 48% were caught or harvested during 2023. Compare that to Teleco, we did a similar cruel survey in 22 and 23 as well, and over 90% of those trout were harvested, and over 100% were caught and released. So it's a, uh, a different beast over there, a lot more fish interacting with the anglers in that system. And that this is a popular fishery with a lot of people on the river and from various places. We had people from 14 different states, from California to New Hampshire, and a lot of people on boat and on the bank even talked to one fly fisherman that was using crickets. So it's important to keep in mind all those different ways that people are using the river and that it is uh, very important economically. The half million dollars in direct expenditures is nothing to sneeze at. There's people that depend on the river that, that have businesses there, the local residents value it, as well as our anglers that are just out there with their valuable spare time. Thank you very much for your time with this public input process. This presentation lays out the biological guardrails of what we've been seeing on the river and what's possible. And as we work through this writing of the management plan, we want to incorporate the public input as well as what we've been seeing in the water and I encourage you to take the survey it's, we'll work that in over the next several months and we'll have a management plan that the public has been a part of and we'll create a great fishery for many years to come. Thank you.